This is number 38 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to take a close look at Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Paul Revere was a devoted patriot and a high son of liberty who risked his life and comfort for a cause he was completely committed to. Paul Revere is not really best described as a leader of the patriot movement. I think he could best be described as the messenger of the patriot leaders. Before phones or internet, Revere was the message delivery system. Not only was Paul Revere the messenger of the patriot leaders, but at the time of his famous ride, he was acting as their eyes by spying on British troop movements in Boston. Because Revere was so close to top patriots such as Sam Adams, John Hancock, and Joseph Warren, British authorities were aware of him and traitors within patriot leadership reported his activities to British leaders. Despite all his hard work and sacrifice, Paul Revere was ultimately disappointed that he was not given an officer's commission in the Continental Army. I think he felt a little overlooked by his Patriot leader friends, but he was given an officer's commission in the Massachusetts State Army. The story of Paul Revere's ride is endlessly interesting and a personal favorite of mine. Paul Revere's ride is one of the most famous events in American history, and I think the fame he achieved as a result of it probably would have surprised him. During this podcast, I'll try to use Paul Revere's own words as much as possible to tell us about his ride. One last important detail. Paul Revere began his famous ride on Tuesday, April 18th, 1775. So in honor of this famous event, I'm releasing this podcast on Tuesday, April 18th, the anniversary of his ride. At the time Paul Revere made his famous ride, the situation in Massachusetts was very tense. As a result of the Boston Tea Party, the British government had reorganized the government of Massachusetts, and General Gage, who was commander-in-chief of British forces in North America, was made governor of Massachusetts. But there were really two governments. The colonial leaders of the Massachusetts House of Representatives had fled Boston and formed their own government, called the Provincial Congress, which pretty much ran the whole state. Gage's authority really only extended to Boston. Outside of that, the Provincial Congress ran the government of the rest of the colony of Massachusetts. Gage had several thousand troops at his disposal in Boston, but even these few thousand troops weren't enough for him to really enforce his authority or the king's authority over the rest of the colony. He kept telling government officials in London that he would need far more men than what he had if they really hoped for him to do what they wanted him to do. And authorities in London were getting impatient with Gage. They wanted him to act. They wanted him to arrest the ringleaders, the the colonial patriot ringleaders, and bring them to justice. Before we talk about Paul Revere's ride, we should probably talk a little bit about Boston and how much it's changed since his time. On the screen right now is a map showing what Boston's shoreline looks like today in the red line. The red line shows what the shoreline is today, and the black lines show what Boston looked like back in 1775 when Revere did his ride. You can see how much it's expanded out into the ocean. In addition to the geographic changes, Boston has changed in other important ways today, too. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, all of the colonies were very Protestant, and no place was more staunchly Protestant than Boston, Massachusetts. Every year they burned effigies of the Pope, and there were laws on books in just about all the colonies that Catholics couldn't vote or hold public office, and that was especially true in Boston. Paul Revere himself was of French origin. His father's name was Apollos Rivois, which they anglicized to Paul Revere, And because his ancestors were Protestants, French Huguenots who were Protestants, he was allowed to live there like anyone else and fit right in perfectly. Today in Boston, there's a heavy Catholic influence, which came about mainly because of all the influx of Italians and Irish that have come there. That never would have happened probably in Paul Revere's time. Okay, on the screen right now is a map of what Boston looked like in 1775 when Paul Revere did his famous ride. I tried to be sparing with the detail because then it gets too cluttered. I instead just focused on an important uh, or on the more important places in Boston that pertain to this particular podcast issue. At Boston's North End, I've indicated where Paul Revere's house was and still is. It's still there today. It's a popular tourist spot and also where the Old North Church was. This is where Paul Revere had the lanterns hung in the steeple as a signal to the guys over in Charleston. It was one of the tallest buildings in the city at that time, so it was a good place to hang lanterns from if you wanted to signal someone across the water. It's still there today, too. A little south of the Old North Church, I've indicated where the Green Dragon Tavern is. This is where Paul Revere met with John Hancock and Samuel Adams, Benjamin Church, and uh, Joseph Warren, who were all important colonial patriot leaders, and where they coordinated their activities in opposition to the British. In speaking about these meetings, Paul Revere wrote, 
In the fall of 1774 and winter of 1775, I was one of upwards of 30 chiefly mechanics who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movements of the British soldiers and gaining every intelligence of the movements of the Tories. We held our meetings at the Green Dragon Tavern. We were so careful that our meetings should be kept secret that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that they would not discover any of our transactions. Paul Revere mentions mechanics in that passage. And what he means is people basically who work with their hands. Now, today we think of mechanics as someone who works on cars or repairs automobiles, but that wasn't the case back then. Now, Paul Revere had been involved in serving the patriotic movement since 1773. He wrote, In the year 1773, I was employed by the select men of the town of Boston to carry the account of the destruction of the tea to New York. He's talking about the Boston Tea Party there. And afterwards, 1774, to carry their dispatches to New York and Philadelphia for calling a Congress and afterwards to Congress several times. So he was used to writing and writing at night, which he did a lot of. So he was an ideal candidate, of course, for what he had to do on that night of his famous ride. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Now, one of the important points we have to emphasize in this podcast is there was nothing that was really secret. The British leaders and the Patriot leaders had people in position in both leadership circles so that they could spy on each other and get intelligence from each other. It's very possible that General Gage's wife, who was American-born, was feeding intelligence to Patriot leaders. And in the highest circles of Patriot leadership, there was a man named Benjamin Church, who they thought was a Patriot leader, but really he was a spy for Gage. They knew someone was spying because things kept leaking out, and Paul Revere wrote about this. He said, It was then a common opinion that there was a traitor in the Provincial Congress, and that Gage was possessed of all their secrets. All right, back to our map. If you go a little further south, you can see where John Hancock's house was. I've shown that on the map. And then off to the left, you can see I've put a little dot there. For those of you that like the sitcom Cheers, that's probably where the Cheers bar would have been in 1775 had it existed. It would have been out in the water. Just a few days before Paul Revere's ride, Gage received orders from London, basically telling them to get on with it. They felt that he had enough troops. The British authorities in London saw this stuff in in Massachusetts. They were uh, as nothing more than a, a provincial problem that he could put down with a good show of force. They were still angry over the Boston Tea Party, and they wanted someone punished. The order said in part, It is the opinion of the king's servants, in which his majesty concurs, that the first and essential step to be taken towards reestablishing government would be to arrest and imprison the principal actors and abettors of the provincial congress, whose proceedings appear in every light to be acts of treason and rebellion. So there wasn't much wiggle room for Gage left. He, He had to act. He had to arrest the leaders, John Hancock and Samuel Adams especially. And he also formulated a plan that at the same time he would seize the gunpowder, cannon, and other munitions that were stored at Concord. He knew that there were military supplies there because his spies had told him that. And he had already done raids on other places in Massachusetts to, to seize their powder and their artillery and so forth. And the Patriot leaders in Boston who found out about Gage's orders almost as quickly as he did were determined not to let this happen again to them. Now, for their parts, John Hancock and Samuel Adams had already fled Boston. They were hiding in Lexington. We'll talk more about them in a few minutes. And Gage sent spies back into the back country to try and find out where they were and also to locate other places where there might be munitions stored. And everyone knew who these spies were. They were British officers, despite their disguises. And it just alerted and tipped off the back country that something was going to happen. So on April 16th, two days after the orders arrived for Gage to to get busy with arresting the ringleaders, Paul Revere, who was already informed of these orders to Gage because all the Patriot leaders knew about these orders, he went into the back country. He met with Samuel Adams and John Hancock in Lexington, informed them of what was happening. And he also met with other leaders around the colony to set up an alarm system so that they would know what was going to happen. Each town would have a dispatch rider so that when Paul Revere or whoever rode through and let them know that the troops were coming, that rider then would ride out to another designated route to alert other homes and villages who would then send out other riders so that the word would spread quickly throughout Massachusetts. So when Revere gets to Charleston, Charlestown actually it was pronounced back then, which is a town that was just north of Boston on that little peninsula, it was just within sight of Boston, he worked out the famous lantern signal that we've always heard about, the one if by land, two if by sea. In describing this, Paul Revere wrote, I had been to Lexington to Mr. Hancock's and Mr. Adams, who were at the Reverend Mr. Clark's. I returned at night through Charleston. There I agreed with a Colonel Conant and some other gentlemen that if the British went out by water, we would show two lanterns in the North Church steeple, and if by land, one is a signal, for we were apprehensive it would be difficult to cross the Charles River or get over Boston Neck. 
If you look at the map on the screen, you can see that Boston is almost an island. At the south end of Boston, there's a narrow neck of land, and sometimes at high tide that would flood, making Boston basically an island. There was a very good chance that Paul Revere or any other writer would be able to get out of Boston to alert the Patriot leaders which way the British were going to go. The British had two choices. They could either go south over land or they could cross the water just west of Boston there and land near Cambridge and then go on to to Concord. So the Patriot leaders knew what the objective of the British were. They just didn't know exactly what route they were going to take. So the lanterns in the church steeple would give the guys in Charlestown the information about which way the British were going. And they, in turn, whether Paul Revere showed up or not, they were going to send out their own dispatch rider to start alerting the back country. One other interesting detail in this account here, Paul Revere calls these lanterns, he calls them lanterns. And the reason for that is back then, instead of using glass or plastic like we would as the lenses on the four sides of a lantern, they used bullhorn. They would boil these bullhorns, bull's horns, and then peel them off by layers. And once you did that, the the bull's horn layer was kind of translucent, so light would pass through it softly. And that's what they used to surround the lantern with that we would use glass or plastic for today. That's why they called them lanterns. So now that Gage's orders were known and the Patriot leaders knew it was going to happen, Paul Revere takes on another role. He's not only a messenger and courier, he's now going to act as a spy. He's going to keep tabs on these British troops. He and many of the other men in Boston did. He writes about this saying, In the winter towards the spring, we frequently took turns two and two to watch the soldiers by patrolling the streets all night. The Saturday night preceding the 19th of April, about 12 o'clock at night, the boats belonging to the transports were all launched and carried under the sterns of the men of war. They had been previously hauled up and repaired. We likewise found that the grenadiers and light infantry were all taken off duty. So what Revere and the other patriots are observing is that Gage is preparing for probably what appears to be a waterborne attack. He's collecting the transport ships, repairing them, moving them to the west side of Boston there so they can take ferry the troops from Boston across to where like Cambridge is and go that route to Concord. And they're also noticing, as Revere said, that he's detached the light infantry and the grenadiers from the regular units. Both the Grenadiers and the Light Infantry were elite units. The Grenadiers were the tallest, biggest men in the army, and they wore a very tall, black, bearskin miter cap on top. We've all seen these in pictures of British troops. This made them look even bigger and imposing, and they were used as shock troops. The Light Infantry were the most agile, fastest men in the army. They were adept at forest fighting, at least more so than regular troops were, and they were faster than regular troops. They could run faster and longer, and they also wore, they didn't wear the regular hat that regular infantry wore. They wore like a leather cap with a little plume in it, so they were very dashing. They were also an elite unit like the Grenadiers. So it was obvious to everyone that that Gage was preparing to do a waterborne attack. The Grenadiers light infantry would ferry across the water uh, to the shore near Cambridge and then from there go on to Concord and find Hancock and Adams and also seize all the stores. Now since there was so much spying, the Patriot leaders had no idea if the British knew where Hancock and Adams were. One of the things that's amazing to me in all of this is how much time and dedication Revere has to the cause. He's a silversmith who works a normal job during the day trying to make ends meet. And then at night, he's spending all night spying on the British, taking turns, not to mention his duties as his courier duties, delivering messages and so forth for Massachusetts's Provincial Congress. So he was a very committed person or he just had a lot of energy. Maybe he had both, but he was certainly a devoted patriot. On April 18th, which was a Tuesday evening, Paul Revere gets an urgent message from Joseph Warren. Warren was the top leader of the Patriot movement in Massachusetts. He had remained in Boston, even though he could have been arrested. I think Gage was afraid to arrest him. It probably would have caused rioting. It certainly would have. And so he was just left in place. And since Gage was getting all the information he needed from spies, I don't think he worried about him too much. And Joseph Warren is a really interesting guy. Maybe down the road we could do another podcast just on him. He ends up being killed at the Battle of Bunker hill but on tuesday night april 18th he summons paul revere urgently to his house on the map there of boston joseph warren's house would have been near the green dragon tavern it's not there anymore but all the research i've done suggests it was pretty close to the vicinity of the green dragon tavern in writing about this paul revere wrote about 10 o'clock dr warren sent in great haste for me and begged that i would immediately set off for lexington and inform samuel adams and their honorable john hancock esquire that there was a number of soldiers composed of light troops and grenadiers marching to the bottom of the common where was a number of boats to receive them 
it was supposed that they were going to Lexington by way of Cambridge River to take them or to go to Concord to destroy the colony stores. Warren also informed Paul Revere that he had sent another writer off, a guy named William Dawes, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, south. He'd sent him south through the neck of Boston, and Revere would go north across the water. This way, at least, there's a better chance that one of them would get out to spread the alarm. Now, both Revere and Dawes were given a handwritten message, which they were supposed to give to Hancock and Adams when they got to Lexington. It said, a large body of the king's troops, supposed to be a brigade of about 12 or 1,500, were embarked on boats from Boston and gone to land at Lechmere's Point. This was his note that he was supposed to give to, ha- to Adams and Hancock when he met them. So Revere then goes to the North Church. He had three friends meet him there. One of them worked at the church, and he had a key to it. He told them what to do, and they went up to the bell tower and hung the two lanterns. And interestingly, after they did that, a patrol of British troops came to the church, and these guys barely escaped. They ran down and were able to get out a back window and so they weren't captured. So Paul Revere then writes, I then went home, took my boots and cert out and went to the north part of the town where I had kept the boat. Two friends rode me across Charles River a little to the eastward where the Somerset men of war lay. It was then young flood. The ship was winding and the moon was rising. They landed me on Charleston side. When I got into town, I met Colonel Conant and several others. They said they had seen our signals. I told them what was acting and went to get me a horse. I got a horse of Deacon Larkin. While the horse was preparing, Richard Devens Esquire, who was one of the committee of safety, came to me and told me that he came down the road from Lexington after sundown that evening, that he met 10 British officers, all well-mounted and armed, going up the road. Gage knew that Revere and other riders would be out that night, so before he did anything with his troops, he sent patrols out on the roads, about 20 men total, to try and capture and stop some of these express riders. And they they must have captured some of them, because they're some of them were seen being captured by them. One of the things I have to mention here is that Revere is rowed across the water from the north edge of Boston to Charlestown, which is not very far away. But in doing so, he has to go right by the bow of this large British warship called the Somerset. It has 64 guns on it. It's a very large, powerful ship. The British had put it there to block any communications between Charlestown and Boston that night. It's true it was a full moon that night, which gave a lot of light, but there was a kind of an anomaly that the moon was hanging low in the sky at this time. It was a little after 10 p.m. And so the town of Boston probably blocked it out, and Paul Revere and his men were probably in the shadow of the town of Boston. The moon wasn't high enough yet, and that's probably how they weren't seen by this warship. That would have been a very nerve-wracking thing to do. On the screen right now is a little map. It shows the route that Paul Revere took from North Boston. He rows across the water to Charlestown. He gets a horse, and then he goes west from there. And you can see the red line that shows the path he took. He said, the moon shone bright. And he wrote, I set off upon a very good horse. It was then about 11 o'clock and very pleasant. After I had passed Charlestown Neck and got nearly opposite where Mark was hung, what he's referring to here is that Mark was a slave who had killed his owner, and they had hung him and then left his body there in chains to rot, and it was meant to be a lesson to teach anyone else, and it was a major thoroughfare for a lot of people would have seen it. So continuing Paul Revere's narrative, he writes after passing Mark, who was hung in chains, he says, I saw two men on horseback under a tree. When I got near them, I discovered they were British officers. One tried to get ahead of me and the other to take me. I turned my horse very quick and galloped towards Charlestown Neck and then pushed for the Medford Road. The one who chased me, endeavoring to cut me off, got into a clay pond near where the new tavern is now built. I got clear of him and went through Medford over the bridge and up to Menotomy. In Medford, I awaked the captain of the Minutemen and after that I alarmed almost every house till I got to Lexington. So on the screen right now you can see a little map that I put up there that shows Paul Revere's route. It's the faint red line that goes north out of Boston through Charlestown and through the neck. The little red explosion right there is the event that just occurred where the two British officers were hiding behind a tree or under a tree and tried to arrest Revere. He had to take a detour through Medford. He intended on going directly to Lexington, but he had to take this detour. Maybe that was a fortunate detour, though. It might have saved him from being captured by other patrols that night, and word might not have gotten out as quickly. 
quickly or as thoroughly. So continuing with his narrative, he arises in Lexington, where he wrote, I found Mr. Hancock and Adams at Reverend Mr. Clark's. I told them my errand and inquired for Mr. Dawes. They said he had not been there. I related the story of the two officers and supposed that he must have been stopped as he ought to have been there before me. After I had been there about half an hour, Mr. Dawes came. We refreshed ourselves and set off for Concord to secure the stores, etc. that were there. Now, there's a story that when Paul Revere arrived at this house where Adams and Hancock were staying, that there was a sergeant there, a militia sergeant named Monroe. He was there to protect them in case they were attempted to be captured by the British. And Revere was there and he showed up. He was being loud and Monroe told Revere that the men were sleeping. They needed to be quiet. And Revere said, noise, you'll have noise before long. The regulars are coming out. This brings us to another question. A lot of people wonder what Revere actually said that night. In popular stories, they always have him saying, The British are coming. The British are coming. Both he himself and all the people that he was alarming considered themselves as British. So this would have sounded silly to them. It is true that in later accounts of these events, he talks about the British. But these were years after for these events, after we had gained independence. So by then, yeah, he felt that they were a separate nationality. It's most likely that he said something along the lines, the regulars are coming out. Meaning that the regulars are the regular troops, not the militia, but the regular British army is coming out. In his own account, he often refers to the troops as the ministerial army. This is because in old English tradition, you couldn't accuse the king of doing something wrong. You might be accused of treason. So oftentimes people would blame the king's ministers, meaning his prime ministers and ministers of state. It has nothing to do with the church or clergy. And this is what they're doing here. They're talking about the ministerial army, the the troops that are under the command of the corrupt king's ministers. So this way they're not actually blaming the king. So after Dawes and Revere leave Lexington, They're soon overtaken by a man named Samuel Prescott. He had been in Lexington, too. He had a a fiancé there, and he was visiting her that night. On the map, you can see the different colors I've shown for the different riders, the routes they took. Revere, of course, is in the faint red color. Dawes's path from Boston down the South Neck is in yellow, and they're joined in or west of Lexington by Samuel Prescott. His is in purple. Writing of this, Paul Revere says, We were overtaken by young Dr. Prescott whom we found to be a high son of liberty. That means he was an ardent patriot like Revere was. I told them of the 10 officers that Mr. Devens met and that it was probable we might be stopped before we got to Concord. For I suppose that after night they divided themselves and that two of them had fixed themselves in such passages as were most likely to stop any intelligence going to Concord. I likewise mentioned that we had better alarm all the inhabitants till we got to Concord. The young doctor much approved of it and said he would stop with either of us for the people between that and Concord knew him and he would give the more credit to what we said. We had nearly got halfway, Mr. Dawes and the doctor doctor stopped to alarm the people of a house. I kept along when I had got about 200 yards ahead of them. I saw two officers as before. I called to my company to come up saying there were two of them for I had told them what Mr. Devens told me and of my being stopped. In an instant I saw four of them who rode up to me with their pistols in their hands and said if you go an inch further you are a dead man. Immediately Mr. Prescott came up. We attempted to get through them but they kept before us But they being armed with pistols and swords, they forced us into the pasture. The doctor jumped his horse over a low stone wall and got to Concord. So apparently Prescott was able to escape. And in some accounts, Dawes also escapes as well. This is an interesting part of the story that a lot of people don't know, that Paul Revere was actually captured that night by British patrol while he was alarming the countryside. The British officers told Paul Revere that they were out looking for deserters, which was a lie, of course. They were out doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They were capturing dispatch riders like Paul Revere. That's what Gage had sent them out to do. Paul Revere knew this, and he mentions it to him. He, he says, I told them I knew better. I knew what they were after, that it alarmed the country all the way up, that their boats were crashed aground, and I should have 500 men there soon. Paul Revere writes, One of them, whom I since learned was Major Mitchell of the 5th Regiment, clapped his pistol to my head and said he was going to ask asked me some questions. If I did not tell the truth, he would blow my brains out. So they questioned him and Revere said they abused much. So it must have been a rough night of questioning. There were other captives there too. So they'd captured some other people and pretty soon they decided they would go back towards Lexington, possibly to meet the oncoming British troops so they could join up with them. Maybe they were a little frightened of being out in the countryside like that. So Revere says that Major Mitchell told him, we are now going towards your friends and if you attempt to run or we are insulted, we will blow your brains out. When we 
had got into the road, they formed a circle and ordered the prisoners in the center and to lead me in the front. We rid towards Lexington a quick pace. They were often insulting me, calling me rebel, etc., etc. Revere describes next what happened when they got near Lexington, which was not far away. He said, When we got within sight of the meeting house, we heard a volley of guns fired, as I supposed, at the tavern, as an alarm. The major ordered us to halt. He asked me how far it was to Cambridge, and many more questions which I answered. So after this, they set Revere free. He's on foot now, and he makes his way back to the Clark house where Hancock and Adams are staying. So Revere is freed by his captors, and he writes... I went across the burying ground and some pastures and came to the Reverend Mr. Clark's house where I found Mr. Hancock and Adams. I told them of my treatment and they concluded to go from that house towards Woburn. I went with them. So Hancock and Adams didn't really know if the British knew where they were at, so they thought it would be a good idea to head to Woburn. You can see it there on the map because, after all, Lessington's right in the path of the British troops are coming headed their way and they don't want to be captured. And so Revere decides to go with them. But there's a problem. There's a trunk full of confidential papers and state papers from the Provincial Congress that belong to John Hancock, and they're in the Buckman Tavern at Lexington. So Paul Revere volunteers to go with Hancock's secretary or clerk named Mr. Lowell. They go back to Lexington. They're hearing reports of the troops getting closer. They go to the Buckman Tavern. They go up and get this trunk full of paperwork, and and Paul Revere writes about these events in these words. He says, when we got there to the Buckman Tavern, we were told the troops were within two miles. We went into the tavern to get a trunk of papers belonging to Mr. Hancock. Before we left the house, I saw the ministerial troops from the chamber window. We made haste and had to pass through our militia, who were on a green behind the meeting house, to the number, as I supposed, about 50 or 60. I went through them. As I passed, I heard the commanding officer speak to his men to this purpose, saying, Let the troops pass by and don't molest them. And then Revere went on to describe how he heard the very first shots uh, at Lexington Green. These were the first shots of the American Revolution. On the screen, you can see the little map down at the bottom right-hand corner is the Buckman Tavern, where Paul Revere and Mr. Lowell retrieved John Hancock's trunk full of important papers. And the little thread indicates the path Revere took through the American militia. And at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the red lines showing the British troops coming and forming up on the green and where the first shots of the American Revolution were fired. So all of these events in Lexington, as Revere escapes from the Buckman Tavern with Mr. Lowell in the trunk of papers, that occurs at about 5 a.m. The sun was just coming up. He'd been up all night doing this ride. Now, his ride effectively ends much earlier in the evening when he's captured by the British patrol between Lexington and Concord. And on the screen right now, you can see a map. Uh, The little red line coming out of Boston shows approximately how far Paul Revere rode that night on his horse. And then around it, you can see all the shaded white area. That shows how far the alarm that he and William Dawes started, how far it had spread by 9 a.m. the next morning. And each community that was informed of this sent their militia. They all went down to Lexington and Concord and gave the British quite a bloody nose as they tried to get back to the safety of Boston. That's, That's another exciting podcast in the future we'll talk about. But the alarm was very consequential that Paul Revere helped trigger. And as you can see, just by listening to this podcast, there were many writers that night. He wasn't the only one. He and William Dawes were not the only two. There were there were many more. There are a couple of ironies in Paul Revere's life. The first one I want to touch on has to do with his desire to be a commissioned officer in the Continental Army. If he could distinguish himself in battle, he could probably move up the social ranks and maybe become a leader like Samuel Adams and John Hancock was. He was certainly brave and very tenacious, but he never did get that commission. He was an officer in the Massachusetts State Army, but never in the Continental Army. To a friend, he wrote, I had expected before this to have been in the Continental Army, but do assure you, I have never been taken notice of by those whom I thought my friends and am obliged to be contented in this state's service. So I think he felt a little bit of bitterness and disappointment that the people he'd worked with and worked with and worked for so hard had noticed him more and did nothing to promote him. But the irony is, had he become a Continental officer, I don't think he could have gained much more fame than he really got. With the exception of George Washington, few Americans know who any of the Continental officers were. None of them certainly eclipsed his fame for that famous night ride that he did. And I don't think anything he could have done in the Army would have given him more prominence or fame than he did by his midnight ride, or that he'd obtained by his midnight ride. Problem was, he didn't get any fame or glory for it in his lifetime. No one had heard of him. His midnight ride was not famous or popular during his lifetime, and he got very little notice for it. 
The other interesting irony has to do with a poem that was written about Paul Revere in the early 1860s by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. We've probably all heard this poem. It starts, Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. It was Longfellow's poem that that put Paul Revere on the map and made him famous, I think. Longfellow's poem gave us some of the phrases that we're used to hearing, such phrases as one if by land and two if by sea, talking about the lantern signals from the Old North Church. In talking about the Old North Church, Longfellow writes, And the moonlight flowing over all, beneath in the churchyard lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still. And later in the poem, he goes on to say, The belfry tower of the Old North Church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. So Longfellow really plays up the mystery and the intrigue of Paul Revere's ride. He ends his poem by saying, So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm. To every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofs beats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. So Longfellow's poem is very poetic. Uh, it does have some historical inaccuracies in it, but it is good poetry. But here's the irony. Paul Revere served with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's ancestor in a couple of the campaigns around Massachusetts and in New England there. He was an officer also, and so they knew each other, which is kind of ironic, I think. On the screen right now, you can see a part of one of Paul Revere's handwritten accounts of his famous ride, and if you look carefully, you can actually see some of the words that he wrote and make them out. This is the account I've been reading from most of the night. For further reading, I recommend the following books and articles. Paul Revere's Three Accounts of His Famous Ride, published by the Massachusetts Historical Society. Paul Revere's Ride, by David Hackett Fisher. A True Republican, The Life of Paul Revere, by Jane E. Triber. Red Dawn at Lexington, If They Mean to Have a War, Let It Begin Here, by Louis Birnbaum. The Founding of a Nation, A History of the American Revolution, 1763-1776, to by Merrill Jensen. Decisive Day, The Battle for Bunker Hill, by Richard M. Ketchum. Sam Adams, Pioneer and Propaganda, by John C. Miller. John Hancock, Merchant King and American Patriot, by Harlow Gates Unger. The Revolutionary War, America's Fight for Freedom, by Bart McDowell. Why the March to Concord, by John Richard Alden. Published in the American Historical Review, Volume 49, Number 3, April 1944. Paul Revere Exercise, by MLS, published in the Journal of Education, Volume 63, Number 12, March 22, 1906. A Gift of Paul Revere Silver, by EHW, published in the Bulletin of the Museum of Fine Arts, Volume 24, Number 142, April 1926. And Dr. Thomas Young and the Boston Committee of Correspondence, by Bruce Henry, published in the Huntington Library Quarterly, Volume 39, Number 2, February 1976.